Okay, we're recording. So, you'll remember that last week um, we discussed the um, parallel um, authorities of the Nasi on the one hand, who is based in Eretz Israel, and the Reish Galuta, uh, this head, the Exilarch, which is the way it's translated in, in English, the Reish Galuta, the head of the uh, uh, the head of the um, community in Bavel. Um, and remember, we have two uh, editions of the Talmud. We have the Talmud Bavli, which is what we're learning, which, <coughs> which is based from the, uh, the Chachamim in Bavel, in Babylonia. And we have the Talmud Yerushalmi, uh, the Jerusalem Talmud, which um, confusingly was not put together in Jerusalem, it was put together uh, in the area of the Galil, uh, in northern Israel, but it's called the Talmud Yerushalmi. And there were two parallel communities going on, very much like there are today. We have our di diaspora community, which is largely based in North America uh, and, and Europe, and uh, we have the community in Eretz Israel. And we said that anybody, anybody who wanted to judge monetary cases uh, needed to have our they didn't need to have, but if they wanted to be exempt from liability, if they made a mistake, then they needed to have authority from the uh, either the Nasi, if they were in Israel, or the Reish Galuta, if they were in Bavel. And we spoke about that last week, and we asked the question, which was a higher authority? And um, we, we quoted this, uh, this pasuk from Parashat Vayechi, um, which was here, Lo yasur shevet mi Yehuda, umchokek mi bein raglav, the scepter shall not, uh, shall not be removed from Yehuda, umchokek and the ruling staff from between... I'll share your screen, Johnny. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll thank you, you Johnny, yes. I'll share the screen. Yeah, thank you, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. sorry. Thank you, Johnny. So we uh, we we had this pasuk lo yasur shemet mi yuda the 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 scepter the scepter of ruling shall not be removed from yuda and mechokek mi bein raglav the ruling staff from between his uh, legs and we learnt from that that uh, it says in the Gemara here. Lo yasur shevet mi Yehuda, elu rashei galuyot shev bebavel. They, uh, this, this shevet mi Yehuda, this idea that uh, the rulership will never re be removed, this refers to the rashei uh, galuyot, which is the plural of resh galuta. Sherodin um, et Yisrael b'shevet. They uh, subjugate the Jewish people with a scepter, as with a scepter. In other words, they were very strong, they were very strict. Why? Because they had, as we spoke last week, they had authority from the, uh, from the government. They were in the third tier of government, uh, as it were. They, they, the power was devolved to the Reish Galuta from the uh, Babylonian uh, government or the Persian government when they took over, or the Medes, or whoever it happened to be at the time. This was the uh, Nasi uh, in Eretz Israel, who, although they had a certain degree of autonomy, did not have power devolved to them from the Roman, uh, the Roman rulers. So their power was less than that of the Reish Galuta. So, as you would expect, since we're learning Talmud Bavli, uh, the uh, rabbis here uh, say that the Reish Galuta in Bavel has a higher authority, as it were, than the Nasi. So they asked the question. Uh, they asked the question. What about if you've got permission in Bavel, are you allowed to rule in Eretz Israel? Clearly, they would say, yes, you can, because our uh, um, authority is of a higher level than that of, um, that of the Eretz Israel. And we spoke about the idea of somebody with a degree from Oxford 
uh, going to give a lecture in uh, Bognor Regis Polytechnic. Uh, and uh, I, I hope I wasn't offending anybody and they didn't get their degree from Bognor Regis Polytechnic, if there is one. So, um, and th so that was a fairly obvious answer that uh, if you have a authority from the Reish Galuta and then you go over to Eretz Israel, that you are allowed to uh, rule there. But what about the other way around? And that's where we left it last week, if you will remember. What about the other way around? What about somebody who has got his authority from the Nasi in Eretz Israel, and he then moves to Bavel? Does he need to requalify? Does he need to go back to the Reish Galuta of Bavel and get authority from him? Or does his authority from the Nasi in Eretz Israel does that cover him to practice uh, as a judge in Bavel? That's the question of our Gemara, and that's where we left it last week. So, May Hatam, Hatam is over there, May Hatam. From over there. In other words, if you have authority from over there, remember I told you that the, in Talmud Bavli, Hatam over there refers to Eretz Israel. La Hacha. Hacha means here. Bavel. So, may Hatam la Hacha mai. If you've got authority from over there, what's the halacha about over here? That's our question. Tashima. Come and listen. That's the introductory way that the Gemara tells you that it's going to make a suggestion. Tashma, come and listen. The Rabba Barchana dan dina v'ta'a. Rabba Barchana, not to be mistaken with somebody called Rabba Bar Barchana, who is another person altogether. Uh, over here, you can see who this person was. Uh, he was a first-generation Amora. He went to Eretz Israel together with his uncle, Rabbi Chia, who we've heard of already, to study Torah there. Rabbi was a cousin and colleague of Rav and studied with him both in Eretz Israel and Babylonia. His only known student was Rav Hananel, Rabbi, Rabbi Hananel, who was actually very famous, who was also a student of Rav. Rabbi, oh, here we go, he says it. Rabbi Barchana can easily be confused with Rabbi Bar Barchana, who, according to one opinion, was in fact his son, which would make sense. See, it's, it's called Bar, means Ben in uh, Aramaic. It would make sense that he was his son. So, anyway, this fellow, Rabbi Barchana, he dan dina, he judged the case. He judged the case. Now, it's where did he judge this case? He judged this case in Bavel. Vata'a. And he made a mistake. Ata l'kamei de Rabbi Chia. He came to his uncle, Rabbi Chia. And he said, what shall I do? What shall I do? Do I need to cough up? Because I made a mistake. Am I liable? Remember, if you have authority from the uh, Nasi in Eretz Israel, and you're judging in Eretz Israel, you are exempt from liability if you make a mistake. If you have authority from a Reish Galuta and you are in Bavel, then you are exempt from liability if you make a mistake. If you have authority from the Reish Galuta in Bavel and you are in Eretz Israel, you are also exempt. Our case now is what happens to Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Barchana, who had authority from the Nasi, and he popped over to Babylon, and he judged a case there, and he made a mistake. So he doesn't know. We're going to find out what the halacha is. Amale, Rabbi Chia said to him, I kibluch alaihu, if the litigants up front signed a consent form to say that they were accepting your verdict unconditionally. We spoke about this last week. That the litigants uh, say, we don't care whether you've got authority, you haven't got authority. We accept you. We want you to be our judge. And we both accept your opinion up front before knowing what it is. 
and we accept it unconditionally. If they accepted you unconditionally, lo to shalem, you do not need to pay. Ve'i lo, and if not, if you didn't get their uh, specific and uh, explicit authority to judge unconditionally, then you have to go and pay. And then you can say, Vaha Rabba Barchana, Rashuta Hava Naket. Wait a minute, Rabba Barchana had authority. So why did he need to get that permission from the litigants? Ah, where did he have his authority from? He had his authority from over there, from Eretz Israel. He had his authority from the Nasi. Shma Mina, we learn from here. Uh, literally, listen, uh, listen from this. Shmamina, we learn from here. Mehatam, if you have authority from over there, lahacha, and you come over here to Bavel, lo mahani, it does not help you. It doesn't work. It's not effective. Shmamina, Q E D. That's our proof. We have a proof. We now have a proof. that authority from the Nasi over there in Eretz Israel is not effective in Bavel. Very nice. And normally, when it says Shema Mina, you know that's the end of that and you've got a QED. But not in this case, because we now have another question. The, the Gemara says, Velo Mahani, is that true that it doesn't help? It's not effective? question mark not that you would know that by the way from the big boys Gemara because there's no question marks in there you just have to know it from the context but Lama Hani is it true that, that uh, this is not effective and when that happens you know that you're going to get a proof the other way now so this fellow Rabba Bar Rabba Bar Rav Huna he was involved in some kind of uh, um, argument, a dispute with the members of the household. It means that when it says the household, it means the the um, the court of his of the the Reish Galuta of the Exilog. Okay, they come and they've got some kind of dispute. Uh, um, Amar he said to them, "Lav minaychu nekitna rishuta." I did not receive my authority from you. <coughs> In other words, he says, I'm not under your jurisdiction. So uh, I'm not going to be subjugated to your opinion. I did not get authority from you. Who did I get my authority from? Nakit Narashuta, I got my authority. Me Abba Mari, I got it from my father, my father, my teacher. This is the, uh, the Aramaic way of saying Avi Mori. My father, my teacher, which is a, a uh, covered dicker way of saying, uh, speaking about your father. I got my permission from my father. The Abba Murray and my father, me Rav. He got his authority from this chap, Rav. The Rav, me Rabbi Chia. And Rav got his authority from Rabbi Chia. And Rabbi Chia got his authority, me Rabbi. From Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Now, not surprisingly, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was the Nasi. That's why he's called Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. And so, you can see that this chap, Rabbi Ba Rav Huna, has his authority, if not directly from the Nasi, he has a chain of uh, authority. Going from Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, to Rabbi Chia, to Rav, to Rav Huna, to Rabba Ba Rav Huna. So he comes along and he says to the Reish Galuta's lot, I haven't got any authority from you. I'm not subjugated to you. My, I am uh, subjugated to the authority of the Nasi, of Rebbe. So um, that proves what? That proves that 
uh, that he was in fact able to uh, judge in Babylon, in Babylon, because he's saying he's in Babylon, he's saying, I'm not, I'm not Mishul Bad, I'm not, I'm not subjugated to your authority. I've got my own authority from, from the Nasi. So if you don't like my judgments, hard luck, I'm authorized to do so. And I'm also authorized to do so over here in Babylon. Thank you very much. Um, and so the Gemara says that's a proof that uh, if you have authority from over there, it works for over here, which is the opposite of what the Gemara just said before. So who do we believe? We've got two different opinions. Says the Gemara, nah, nah. He was just, uh, he was just posturing. His word, these were just words. He was just, uh, he was just puffing his chest out and saying, uh, uh, and, and using words to, 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 to give his opinion. It actually, uh, it's actually not true, says the Gemara. There was no, uh, uh, Rav Steinzel says, there was no halachic validity uh, to his statement. In other words, he did not have authority. And the, uh, the uh, art scroll Gemara translates it um, as follows. Um, Rabbi, Rabbi Bar Rav Huna stopped them with mere words. But in reality, he was subordinate to the Reish Galuta. And in the footnote over there, um, it says, um, I don't know how they know this, but it says this, actually, Rabbi Bar Abhuna had obtained authorization to adjudicate from the Reish Galuta as well as his authorization from the Nasi. What he meant by his retort was that his primary authorization came from the Nasi, and not from the Reish Galusa. Uh, but, um, so according to, to uh, that's quoting... If he'd made a mistake, the, Johnny, excuse me, if he'd made a mistake, he might have found something else about it. So Kevin's that again, admitted Johnny? to make him, If he'd made a mistake, like the other guy made a mistake and he admitted to it, that's when it came to light. All this. Uh, well, we don't know that he made a mistake. This is so, I'm saying we don't know if he'd made a mistake. If it would have come to light, if he'd made a mistake. Well, it might have done, yeah, and it, it may well done. be because he was having some kind of dispute with them. We're not yeah. specifically told he made a mistake, but he was having some kind of halachic dispute. Whatever yeah. it was, he was having a halachic dispute. Now, according to the Maharik and the Maram Shif and the Yad David, which is where the, this footnote comes from, uh, actually, Rabbi Bar Rav Huna had smicha, as it were, from the Nasi and the Reish Galuta. Uh, but his, he considered his the smicha from the Nasi to be his primary authority. The simple uh, reading of this, without the footnote, um, and which Rav Steinsalt uh, uh, gives us, is that actually um, uh, he, what he said wasn't actually true. He didn't have authority in uh, the Reish, in the uh, Galut, because he didn't have authority from the Reish Galuta. So the Gemara rejects that proof uh, that we just said. So we're still, we're, so the moment, we are at the point where um, authority from the Nasi in Eretz Israel does not bestow uh, permission to judge free of liability, if you make a mistake, in Bavel, whereas the other way around does. Okay, so we've got a funny question coming up now. Uh, it asks the question before it tells you the situation that are, makes the question arise. Um, so uh, bear with us for a second. Okay, says the Gemara. If we accept that uh, authority from the Nasi does not uh, work, is not effective for uh, judging cases in the Galut, Rabba Bachana, Rashuta, the Naket Lamali. Why did Rabbi uh, Barhana go to the Nasi and get permission from him to authorize immediately before he left to go to Bavel? Now, you didn't know that, did you? But you will in a minute because the Gemara is going to tell us the story. So, what happened was Rabbi Barhana. Uh, was going to go to Bavel, and before he went, he popped over to the Nasi, and he did his smicha test, and he got 
smicha from the nasi. So the question of the Gemara is, what was the point of that? If it's not going to give him any kind of authority when it, where he's going in Bavel, what's the point? Why did he go? Good question. Answers the Gemara, Le'ayarot ha'omdin al ha'gvulin. He was taking a journey from Eretz Israel to Bavel, but he wasn't going uh, by uh, air travel. He wasn't getting on in Ben Gurion and getting off in uh, in Iraq or wherever he was, where they were going into Babylonia. Where's I don't know what is the airport in Iraq. Anyway, wherever it is, he wasn't going there by air. He was going on foot or on a donkey or on a horse. So it was a long journey, and he would stop off at various places on the way. It wasn't a one-day journey. Would have taken him some time to get from uh, Eretz Israel. Probably he lived in the north of Eretz Israel. He would have gone off uh, north and then east to uh, Bavel. And it would have taken him some time and he would have stopped off at various places. So he went to get his smicha so that when he stopped off at these places on the way, and the Gemara says that these, these uh, little towns, Ayarot, are towns. Uh, which stand on the border, close to the border, which are still under the jurisdiction of Eretz Israel, he would be able to judge cases. Remember, these places, these little uh, townships, would not have had their own uh, experts. Uh, they would not have had their own base din. So they would often have to leave up cases uh, until some... Talmid Chacham, some rabbi, some person with authority, would happen by their city. They might have to call them over, um, or they might just have happened on the way to Babylon, they would stop. Um, and they would then judge all those cases that they've had uh, waiting in the wings uh, since the last visit. So it was certainly very likely that Rabbi Barchana would have been asked to judge cases in these various towns on the way to Bavel. And it was for that reason that he went to the Nasi to get his permission, even though where he was, his ultimate destination was Bavel, where it wouldn't help. What he would have obviously had to do, and this is what we, the, uh, the footnote here tells us, is when he got to Bavel, he would have to go to the Reish Galuta and get his uh, smicha endorsed by the Reish Galuta. Very much like you have to do uh, in today uh, in various different things. Uh, if you have a medical degree from uh, uh, various places, you can go and, get, go and get it authorized. You don't have to do very much. In other places, you have, if you've got a degree from other places, you have to do a full exam. You have to do all the exams again. So um, th this is something which is, uh, we can understand uh, from uh, today. Um, and in fact, even, even in the Rabbanot, uh, the same thing occurs today. The, uh, his chief, the Israeli chief uh, rabbinate has a whole list of uh, rabbis um, whose opinions it accepts, particularly we're talking about uh, Geirut, about uh, conversions. And it's got a whole other list, which is much longer, uh, of rabbis that they don't accept, including some very important and, uh, uh, and senior rabbis uh, in the Galut, largely in America, whose opinions on Geirut, on conversions, are not accepted by the uh, Bet Din here in Israel. And this is exactly the same scenario that we are describing here in the Gemara. Nothing changes after 1,500 years. Uh, the same things going on. Uh, that people are precious about their, um, about their authority for smicha. So that was the question we asked. Why did he go? Because he was uh, going to uh, judge in these various other little places. One second, Stanley. I just have a thought and then I'll come to you. By the way, that also still happens, that there are cases in places where they don't have a full bet din, or they, if they do have a full bet din, then the Dayanim there don't have a particular expertise, and they have to wait until uh, people come 
from various places to do that thing. Now that's happened to my son over in Perth. Perth, uh, Australia is a community of around 9,000 Jewish people. <coughs> it has uh, total autonomy in Kashrut. It has its own Kashrut authority. It has its own uh, um, Bet Din. Um, and it has its own rabbinical council, of which my son is the uh, head. However, the Bet Din in Perth, right at the moment, does not have any uh, people who are experienced in doing gittin, in doing divorces, which is a particular uh, qualification that uh, you have to get separately. Now, currently, what happens in, uh, in uh, Perth for divorce cases, and sadly there are a, a number of divorce cases going on, what happens is that the Rabbanim in Perth, the Bet Din in Perth, does all the preparatory work and gets everything ready for this get, does all the, the necessary things, but they have to wait until the senior Diane will come from Sydney or Melbourne, uh, which is a plane ride of four or five hours, uh, to come and actually execute the get, because the rabbis in Perth are not qualified to do gitin yet. Two of them, one of them is my son, and one of the other rabbis are actually learning uh, to the uh, halachot to become dayanim, uh, specifically for that purpose. They are learning to become dayanim, uh, specifically so that they can do gitin, and they don't have to wait for the uh, day because they don't come very often. As you can imagine, it's not, it's, it's a big thing to schlep over a plane journey of four or five hours um, to execute uh, kitchen. So they tend to wait until they've got, you know, two or three or every six months they might come. They're not going to come out more often than that, which means very problematic because you might have a situation, which they do have, where you have a couple who want to get divorced. There's no issue of aginut here where, where there's no, the, the husband doesn't want to give the get. The husband wants to give the get. The wife wants to receive the get. Uh, but it can't be executed because there's no Diane to do it. And you've got a problem because what's happening is the wife is living with her new partner. The husband is living with his new partner. And there are serious isurei dioraisa going on here. There are serious averot being done by people. Uh, in some ways, not their own fault. They want to get over and done with this get, and there's nobody to do it. So uh, 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 when uh, this situation arose, um, my son uh, contacted the Sydney Bent in, and they said, well, no, we can't come. It'll be a few months before we come. And he said, but, you know, we've got this situation. There's this serious Aveiras going on here. Yeah, there was nothing they could do about it. At that moment, he and his colleague, uh, resolved that they will uh, do this studying. It's going to take uh, four years uh, to become a Diane. Uh, and they are going to do that so that they are not reliant on a Rabba Bar Huna situation where they have to wait for somebody else to come. Um, Johnny, you've muted yourself. Myself. Oh, I muted myself. Stanley, speak up. Uh, okay, you know, I, I just want to ask you a question uh, about this disagreement be, be between uh, Rabbanut uh, in Israel and in the United States. I don't understand how that can happen because to be ordained rabbi, what I assume, you have to pass some uh, like exam or something, okay? And if you ordain rabbis in Israel and you ordain rabbis, uh, rabbi in the United States, uh, what is the difference between uh, okay. this ordination? There is no difference, uh, largely. It's, this is an entirely political situation, Stanley. Oh, it, it's political, okay. It's Got politics, it. it's politics. Uh, you could argue, you could argue that, okay, you're gonna take you know, some Shmerel rabbi like me, right? So, okay, I, the, the, you could argue that the chief rabbinate in Israel uh, are not gonna 
uh, accept me as a rabbi. I've got a smicha from a very important and chashuv man, but let's say they don't like this guy. Okay, they don't, they don't like my smicha, but it's all political. You've got people on their blacklist who are top dogs in, ev in anyone's book. So it's entirely political. It's not uh, a halachic issue, sadly. Oh. Julia, unmute. Julia, unmute yourself. I yeah. was just wondering why um, in Australia, the couple who want to be divorced, are they not able to travel? Would the best in, in uh, Sydney uh, not give them the, the get if they travel there? Rather yes. than the... Ra That's a very good question. The answer is yes, they would. Uh, but it's not really bothering them. They're not a from couple. <laughs> oh, and see. they don't really care whether they've got a get or not. The people that care about whether they've got a get or not are the rabbis. Right. right, they don't okay. see anything wrong with what they're doing, so I'll wait six months for a get, big deal. And you know what? If I don't get a get, big deal either, I'm not bothered. So they are not prepared to hop on a plane at various expense, blah 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 blah, uh, because it doesn't mean anything to them. Um, but you're okay. absolutely right, yes, if, if it meant enough to them, they would hop over there. The, the Sydney bet didn't would give them a time to come. Uh, all the preparation has been done, the paperwork's ready, all they'd have to do is go and do it. Um, so, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely it would mean right. something to their children, Johnny, wouldn't it? If they have children, they would. It would if they were if they were planning to have children from the second marriage. Yes. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, they, they, they would without a get. Those children would be mamzerim. Yeah. Uh, now, I, obviously, I don't know the details of, of the cases. I'm I'm not involved. I only I only know from Dan. Um, you know the, the the sort of the bigger picture. Um, now, it could be that they're an older couple who uh, are not planning to have children, or it could be that they don't care on that either. Um, so, uh, it, what, what's clear is that the people who do care are the rabbis in Perth, uh, and they want to get it sorted out. Um, so, it, it's, it, what's interesting to me is that we can see the same pattern of behaviour uh, in the Gemara that the, uh, the, the senior rabbis would go to a place and they'd have cases all ready for them. Um, and um, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, they would uh, judge cases. So that's why Rabbi Bahuna, on his way to Bavel, needed to get his smicha from the Nasi. Yeah, but okay. Johnny, sorry. Um, surely the rabbis have become involved because the couples or the people have asked for a divorce, have asked for a get, you know. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I think the situation is something goes like this. Um, they've done what they've done. They've got a civil divorce and somebody has mentioned to them, you know, you ought to get a Jewish divorce. And so uh, I think their attitude is, well, if it's not too difficult, then I'll get a Jewish divorce. But if it is too difficult, then I'm not really all that bothered. Johnny. Yes, David. Yeah, can, I, can you just qualify a statement we just made? Um, the, the children of such a relationship aren't necessarily mamzerim. It's only where the woman is an Asia Sish, where Correct. the woman's already married. If the woman is, is uh, single, she's never been in a relationship, but there's no steamer on the, the, the uh, children. Correct, on the male side. So, yes, what David is pointing out is that the the... the our couple who are not who have not got a get let's say each of them get married to a jewish person if the man gets married to a jewish woman who is not married to somebody else who is in other words who is not in the same situation who is also not div divorced or, without or, or, or is just living with her and they have a child uh if he is Living with her and she's an Aceous ish, then the child and is she's a mother. not. And if she's not an Aceous ish, then, then there's no question correct, about the, correct, the children. Correct, correct. If the man, let's take it on both sides, <clears throat> the man um, has a relationship with a woman who is not married to somebody else in Jewish law, um, even if he's not married to her, the child is not a mamzer. The translation of mamzer being bastard is not a correct translation. It's the nearest we can get, but it's not a correct, correct translation. Uh, 
a, a mamzer is a child born of a spe specifically forbidden relationship. Now, if we take the woman of our couple, who is not divorced, alpi halacha, in other words, uh, she may have a civil divorce, but she hasn't got a get, she remains married to her first husband. If she then has a child from a Jewish man, or any man, I think, no, I think just a Jewish man, that child is a mamzer, because she is an eshet ish. She is married to the first husband until she gets a get. That is the big issue, to try and avoid mamzerut. Now, um, if, the, uh, if the man is, uh, has a second wife who is in that same situation, so let's say you've got two couples who are waiting a get, and let's say they swap partners, right? There's a case here of that here in Poleg, by the way, in case you didn't know, where two couples got divorced and swapped partners. Um, let's say they didn't get a get, both of them, then you're in trouble on both sides because then you've got Eshet Ish on both sides and any children would be Mamzerim. But David is correct to point out that a Mamzer is uh, a child born of a forbidden relationship. So, for example, incest, the child would be called a Mamzer. Somebody who marries his daughter-in-law uh, would be a, a Mamzer. Any relationship that is forbidden according to the Torah, which is specified as the Arayot, uh, any child of that relationship is called a Mamzer, uh, uh, with all the halachot that goes with it. Thank you, David, for that. Okay. John, John <laughs> just to finish up, the Jewish woman is, has a baby with a non-Jewish man, and what's the difference? If she is an Eshet Ish... Yeah. Um, so she's married, she's not got the get. She's not got a get and she has a child with a non jew a non I don't think that is a mamzer. Yeah. Uh, it's only uh, if it's an Asian ish and a Jewish man. Yeah, okay. I think, I think. Uh, I would have, I'm not 100% sure on that without checking it, but I am, uh, I'll check. Uh, Maurice, are you just stretching or are you wanting to say something? Well, I want to ask you a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, what happens if you have a situation where you require a civil divorce and a get in a country and you've only got the, you've got the get, but you haven't got the civil divorce? Okay, so you've got, so you're not, you're not in Israel because in Israel they go together. Okay, right. so let's say you're in South Africa right. and um, you, ha you, 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 you have a get. And that, but you haven't got a civil divorce. Is that what you're asking? Correct. Al pi halacha, al pi halacha, the civil divorce has no uh, relevance whatsoever. Al pi halacha, you are free to marry somebody else once you have a get. Uh, if you're a woman, you can't marry a Kohen. Uh, but other than that, you can marry uh, whoever you want, um, with, even if you haven't got a civil divorce. Uh, with the exception of there is a, uh, a concept of you have to keep to the, uh, the law of the land. And I assume that in South Africa, bigamy is, a, uh, is an offence. Um, and so you would be falling foul of that. But theoretically, theoretically in Jewish law, a get is what you need. A civil divorce has no relevance whatsoever. Thank you. Uh, yes, Howard. Uh, a child born to two single... Uh, to, a sing to, to a couple, both of whom are, are single, they've never married before and they're not marrying each other either, is not regarded as a mamzer under halachic law. Correct. And uh, according to Israeli civil law, there are no disadvantages either, I assume. None at all. None at all. And no disadvantages either in, in, in Jewish law. Um, yeah. There's a stigma attached to it. Uh, and that, even that's getting less. I'm not, uh, sure, so, I'm not so sure uh, anymore. Yeah, yeah, but uh, no, halachically, 100% kosher, uh, a 100% kosher Jew. No, not, not, not even a, a, you know, a quarter of a mamza, nothing. Uh, a mamza is, a, a, and the problem, of course, is that, I know we're digressing from the Gemara, but we're allowed to because that's what the Gemara does. Um, the problem with mamze root is that it causes massive problems because there's no way of undoing that mamze root or almost no way of undoing that mamze root uh, and they can't marry <coughs> into a, a, 
a kosher Jew. So what Batei Din, what rabbis and Dayanim do, is they go absolutely out of their way, bend over backwards to avoid the Mamza situation happening in the first place. Because once it's happened, it's very, very difficult to undo it. Um, so that is why, for example, the rabbis in Perth were so um, sort of, to not put too fine a point on it, not very pleased with the rabbis in Sydney when they said they wouldn't come for six months because they felt that there was a, a, a possibility here that they may end up uh, with Mamzerim, uh, which they wanted to avoid. And it was that really that prompted them uh, to take this step to actually uh, sort the problem out and become self-sufficient um, and study for Dayanut um, so that they can do it themselves and are not reliant on the Rabba Bar Huna situation of waiting for somebody else to come and do it. So we can say that Dayanim do more for Mamzer, potential Mamzerim than they do for Agunot. Because uh, I don't think anyone's doing yes, anything. That, that is definitely true, Howard. That is definitely true. They definitely do work very hard um, for uh, mam to, to avoid Mamzerut. Uh, in my humble opinion, they don't work anywhere near hard enough to sort out uh, Aganot. Uh, but that's a, 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 a discussion for another day. Yeah. Johnny, do you only need two Diana, you said in Perth, to do a, a get? No, you, you need a base din of three. Uh, yeah. But you only need one Diane who is uh, uh, qualified to do, uh, yeah. the, uh, to do the to do the to do the the get. Uh, in fact, in yeah. Manchester, okay. for example, in Manchester, for, for many many years, uh, Diane Krauss was the yeah. uh, was the one who was the Diane who did all the getting. Even though there were other Diane him, he was the one that was uh, designated for getting. You only need okay. one, one Diane who's qualified. The reason they're doing it together. Is because it's easier when you do it something the chavruta, so they're both doing it together. Good, thank you. Okay, let's uh, you. let's do a few more lines of Gemara. <laughs> any, any anyone have any more questions before I move on? Marcel, did you have a question? Yes. Only to add plus the sofest stam for the for the yeah. get. You need a you need a sofest stam. They've got That's plenty. Very of important. They've got those in Perth. They're okay for that. You need a sofest stam to be able to actually write the get. Uh, that is true, uh, but they've got they've got those there over there in Perth. The only thing they're missing is the is the dying. But thank you for pointing that out. You definitely need to uh, have somebody to write the get, and you have to. And the software stam <coughs> also has to be qualified to write the get. In other words, he has to have had his uh, authority from a previous software stam that he is uh, uh, qualified for writing a, a get, as opposed to writing to fill in or writing Mezuzot, or writing uh, a Megillah, or even a Sefer Torah. All of those things, I know that's, this sounds weird, but all of those things are less important than uh, Gittin, for, as far as Sofer Stam, as far as the scribe is concerned. Why is that? Because all of those things, if you make a mistake in a Sefer Torah, then you can correct it, usually. Uh, if you make a mistake in Tfilin, you can correct the tefillin. And even if you don't, the worst thing you've done, which is not a great thing, is you've not worn kosher tefillin. If you make a mistake in a get, and they then go on to have a child, that child could be a mamzer because you made a mistake in that get. Uh, so uh, the sofa, the responsibility on the dayan, the responsibility on the bet din, and the responsibility on the sofa stam, uh, in Gittin is absolutely huge because of this issue of, uh, of Mamzerut. Uh, uh, so that is something which, which uh, any software stand that you speak to, when they, when they write their first get, they're terrified because uh, they are frightened that they, uh, they could make a mistake that somebody who checks it might not spot. Um, and later on, it will come to light that there was a mistake and there could be by then already in existence uh, uh, a mamzer, and that would be a terrible thing. So, uh, Tony? Yes, Sharon. Just thinking of the uh, sort of par parallel to a paralegal or something, does the sofer stum have to be under the, uh, have to get any of his uh, authority from the rabbinic authority that, that 
is dealing with the get in the first place? In other words, does the rabbinic authority that grants the get then review what the SOFER writes? Or is yes. the SOFER the last word? No, 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 no. The, 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 the Diane, that's part of learning how to do Gittin, is how to check. That's part, probably, actually, the, the, one of the major parts of learning to do Gittin is um, learning the very intricate halacha of what makes a get invalid and what doesn't make a get invalid. So what will happen is the bet din that is doing the get will appoint their sofa stam. Um, and they might, they might have, they'll have their own sofa stam that they will use uh, and, and trust. Somebody may have a different sofa stam. If he's got a qualification from somebody they recognize, they might, they'll accept it. But it's part of the job of the bet din to check the get uh, meticulously. Okay, let's just do another couple of lines um, because it's uh, very interesting. Um, so here we go. My Rashuta, what is the nature of this permission, uh, the smicha uh, that uh, Rabbi Barhana? Now, this is the story I told you that you were coming to from that we know that Rabbi Barhana went from Eretz Israel to Babel. When Rabbi Bar Chana went down to Bavel, Amalei Rabbi Chia, the Rebbe, Rabbi Chia, who was his uncle, said to Rebbe, who, as you know, is Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, he said, Ben Achi, my nephew, the son of my brother, uh, and probably next week you'll understand why I'm stressing son of my brother rather than uh, so just saying nephew. The son of my brother, Yored Le Babel, is going down to Babel. Yore, question mark, may he teach. Can you see that word Yore? It is the root word of something very precious to us. What word is very, what word do you see in there from Yore? Put a taff in front of it and see what happens. Torah. Fear. Is it not fear? Torah. 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 The word Torah is related to this word. Yoreh. What is the Torah? The Torah are teachings. What is a moreh in modern Hebrew? A moreh is a teacher. A morah is a feminine teacher, a lady teacher. Torah comes from the word to teach, the horot, to teach. So the question was, Yore, can he teach? Answers, uh, answers Rebbe, Yore, yes, he can teach. Rebbe Chia then asked Rebbe, Yadin, can he judge? You can see the word din in there, I don't have to show you that. Can he judge as well? Answered Rebbe, Yadin, he can judge. Yatir Bechorot, can he, um, can he permit animals who are firstborns? I'll tell you about that in a second. And the answer was Yatir, yes, he can permit. So that was the nature of the authority. So there appears to be three types of authority given by Rebbe, the Nasi, via Rabbi Chia to um, Rabbi Bar Chana. Two, three types, Yore, Yadin, the Yatir. So Yore, he can teach, Yadin, he can judge, and Yatir, he can permit certain animals. Now, why I'm uh, make, spending some time on this is because this is the basis of today's smicha. The smicha that a rabbi receives, a, a regular rabbi, like the smicha that I received, like the smicha that my son received, like the smicha that Rabbi Do received, is called Yore Yore from this Gemara. Be the yoke from here. Yore Yore. Or if you're in Ashkenazi in Chutzaritz, it's called Yore Yore. Okay? Yore Yore. And that is smicha. When you get smicha, you are called Yore Yore. You're allowed to be a teacher. Uh, and you can uh, you can pass an halacha of things which are to do with uh, um, 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 
things that are permitted or not permitted, so cash rut, things like uh, um, whether you can, what you can and can't do on Shabbat. So all the halachot of Isur Veheter, all those halachot of uh, things that are forbidden or things that are permitted that your regular rabbi would uh, give an opinion on and would give a, a verdict on that if you have uh, authority to do that, you are called Yore Yore. And that comes from this Gemara. When you become a Dayan, when you become a Dayan and you are able to do, um, when you're able to do uh, judgments on monetary cases, remember, what did, how did our whole Gemara start? Dine Mamonot Bishlosha. And we said they had to be expert witnesses, uh, not witnesses, expert judges, remember? So when you get your qualification as a Dayan to judge on monetary cases according to Jewish law, you are then called Yadin Yadin. And that is the course, that is what the course is called, that my son and his Chavruta and various other people are doing. It's, they're doing it online. It's, the course is Yadin Yadin. Their qualification, please God, when they get it, they will be then Dayan and they will be um, Yadin Yadin. At the moment they are Yore Yore, like all regular rabbis. So to become a Dayan, you then become Yadin Yadin. Um, so uh, this is a really nice Gemara for us because it actually sh uh, um, imp uh, impinges on modern day smicha uh, with those terms which are come directly from this Gemara. And I'll just finish off by telling you the third thing which is no longer applicable in our day, uh, and that is Yatir Bechorot. So uh, Rabbi Chia asked Rabbi, can, it, can my nephew also paskin cases of Bechorot? Now, what happens was, uh, back in the day when there was a Beta Mikdash, the firstborn animals had to be brought to the Beta Mikdash and were sacrificed uh, in the temple as a gift to Hashem. But if it developed a blemish, which is known as in Hebrew as a mum, mem vav mum, a mum, if it developed a blemish of some sort, you can't uh, offer this up on the Mizbeach to Hashem, you can't offer a Baal Mum, an animal that has a blemish. What happened to that animal was it was kept by the Kohen, that was one of the uh, gifts that the Kohen got, he was to keep that animal and it could be shechted in the normal way and, and eaten as regular meat, not as a korban. When the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed and we no longer had that situation, a, an animal, which was a, uh, a um, firstborn animal, which required, uh, which, which you, you can't eat that firstborn animal because it's got kochim, it's holy, and it can only be eaten when it's shechted as a korban. What you would do with that animal is you would put it in a meadow or to graze, or you would look after it, you would do it until it developed a mum. And once it developed one of these registered blemishes, it was no longer holy and it could be shechted and you could eat it as regular meat. But it took an expert to know what blemish counts and what doesn't. So, <coughs> for example, if it has a blemish on its eye, a tiny blemish on its eye, that counts as a mum. If it's got a tiny blemish somewhere else, it might not. I'm not qualified to say. I've not got yatir yatir. Nobody's got yatir yatir today. Um, but that's what he was asking for. He was asking for permission for his nephew to have all three qualifications. Yore yore, so that he could be a, a, a paskan halachot of kashrut, shabbat, avelot, all the regular uh, questions that you might ask any rabbi. And he wanted also permission for him to be Yadin Yadin so that he could judge monetary cases. And he wanted uh, permission and authority for Yatir Yatir so that he could uh, um, adjudicate on whether an animal, a certain animal, uh, had a blemish. And uh, Rabbi uh, Rebbe, uh, Rabbi Udanasi, 
gave permission via Rabbi Chia to uh, uh, Rabbi Bar Chana for all three of these, and then off he trotted to Bavel. And that is where we will uh, leave it now. And we're now going to talk about, next week we'll talk about another case um, where uh, permission was asked for uh, the same sort of thing. Um, so those of you who want to read on will know, otherwise you'll have to wait for this exciting uh, next episode uh, next week. Uh, before I, I'm going to say, before I stop the recording, are there any questions that are relevant to the Gemara? Yes, Johnny. Yeah, so Rabbi Shangsal says they declare a firstborn animal that's in the column, halakha. It said it applies still to this halakha, also applies nowadays. Yes, that bit does because we haven't got a, we haven't got a, um, we haven't got a uh, bet amikdash, so they have to be left until it develops a mum. Yeah. So you, so somebody has to still has that has to have that qualification, but it's not to take it to the bet amikdash because there isn't one. It's but just you, a normal chef thing. Normal chef. Once it's developed a mum, once it's developed a mum, and what happens is sometimes is that the owners of the uh, animals, they actually make a mum on the animal, right? Yeah. They know how right. to do it and they make a mum yeah. and there you go. Well, Johnny, yes, uh, I, I, I was reading the same halacha and I, it's gone now so I can't refer to it, but it's suggested it that it was not, it no, 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 wait a minute. It suggests that it was still then given to the priests and that they could sell it. Now, if you are still setting aside the animal and if we still have a Kohen class, and if we would say that this was perhaps your way of paying taxes to the Jewish communal uh, rabbinate or whatever, what happens when an animal develops a mum and is shechted? Is the value of it uh, required to be donated to some communal cause or not? So it belongs to the Kohen, as it says here. The, the Kohen, what you do is, you, let, let's say I'm a farmer and I've got some lambs and I have my firstborn lamb and I put, it in my, in, uh, I put it on one side until it develops a mum. It develops a mum. Um, and I've, I, I, I've, I've designated a Kohen to have that animal. Um, I might have done a deal with the Kohen. I'm not allowed to do a deal directly, a, 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 a binding deal. But I might have an agreement, as it were, under the, uh, uh, under the table agreement. that If I give it to Kohen X... He um, will have it shechted um, and will share it. And I might, another coin might come along and say, well, if you give it me, uh, I might be inclined to gift you 90% of it and only keep 10% of it myself. So you can see how uh, deals might be done. But in fact, al pi al it belongs to the Kohen. Usually the situation is that Kohen uh, will... Um, share it either with the owner itself or with others hmm. so it's not used as a charitable no. or part of any taxation thank you so no, much no, no. any other question marcel unmute marcel unmute oh. there we go yes you're unmuted now marcel yes. that question of, um, a, a, of developing a mum supposing the animal is born with a mum Born with a mum, then it's not a bachar that's fitting for uh, a bet amikdash, okay. and you, 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 you're good to go. Okay. Okay, I will uh, stop the um, recording now.